morning. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm testing my voice here. All right, <clears throat> so uh, welcome. Second meeting in person here. So hopefully you guys have been uh, seeing lectures, seeing me online, and uh, following along. Because uh, it's going to get close to exam time here. So you see this week, a lecture on chapter three, and then uh, I put up a lecture yesterday on the uh, chapter uh, four, and then next week I'll do chapter four, and then we'll see where we're going. So you guys, it takes a lot of uh, self-motivation to make sure you're following along here, right? So I plan on seeing you guys three times a week, seven days a week, uh, but now it's once a week, and uh, the rest you gotta uh, be self-motivated, you know? You don't wanna wait till the last minute to uh, try to cram all this. So that's the plan. Hope you guys see what's going on. You guys are studying. You're following along. Um, you're left now with just a couple chapters that you haven't, you know, read. And these guys are all different. And again, you can do the lectures whenever you want. So it's uh, you have to be on different schedules. But yeah, I want you guys to do well in that first exam. And in lab, you can see that uh, by the end of this week, you all should have done both labs. Take both those quizzes. That's what I care about. And the week after, uh, yeah, I'll test you on that. So, all right. So if you guys are looking at learn smarts or quizzes and stuff like that. The lab, you're doing those those quizzes at the end. Any questions? All right. My job today is to, to lecture on, on some cells and. Uh, I started with cell physiology, and that one chapter. The next chapter includes uh, cell respiration and a little bit of uh, mitosis. I'm not going to like go all over that again. And uh, transcription translation, how we get proteins, how genes work. So yeah, once we finish that, we can move on to real A and P. We can move on to the bones and the muscles and the skin and things like that. So uh, bear with me. We get the more microscopic stuff. Cells, I mean, you guys know what the mitochondria does, the nucleus, things like that. So I, I won't belabor it. I'll just present it and uh, we'll, be, we'll be good for today. All right, cells. So, first of all, um, life can exist in a single cell, like that amoeba up there, and it can do everything in one cell. We are trillions of cells. Now, we can estimate how many cells make us up, but it's trillions an estimate. But uh, you guys came from a, a single cell. That's an egg. That's an egg. Um, so in mom, they actually there was uh, three other little ones. But anyway, in the ovaries, uh, before you're born, women out there, you're uh, you got millions of eggs, and then uh, uh, they go through uh, meiosis a little bit, and you end up with one big one, and then the three little ones just die. They go all over. But uh, everything's put into that one big egg, and it sits there in the ovaries for decades, decades, um, before they start to be called into action. Uh, and puberty starts, and you start ovulating, and one egg at a time, or, or a couple eggs sometimes. Um, from uh, puberty to menopause, so you're going to use about 400 eggs or so in your lifetime, four or 500 eggs. Uh, usually, they're not going to have that many kids, but uh, you know, potentially. And uh, that big cell has has uh, you know half the DNA, mom's DNA, and it's got the mitochondria and other parts of the cell. Now, the sperm from dad it meets the egg, and it just gives a little bit of DNA to the other half of the DNA. And then from that one cell, it divides in two, and then the four and 16, and it divides into these ball cells that get hollow, right? And start developing like that. And uh, early on, when you're just a ball of cells, some of you, at least one pair of twins in here, uh, that cell, ball of cells can split in half and then um, develop two new individuals, you know? And that works for a while until the, until, uh, um, it's too big and then you can't split it in half. You can't like take one person and split it in half and grow two. You can't like starfish and stuff, they're not people. Um, so you start out with one cell that, that splits into those ball of cells and they're, those are stem cells. They can become anything. They can become your skin cells, your eye cells, your bone cells, anything. 
So that's how you guys start out. And uh, all your cells are dependent on the other. We're multicellular. But in the scheme of things, you know, life started out as a single, a single cell. And everything happened in that one cell. And then a uh, colony is kind of in between. Like this is, you probably saw this in biology if you looked at algae and bull bonds. But each one of these individual little green dots can live on its own. But in this colony, they, they share food with each other. And then some of them become reproductive cells in the middle, those little spheres, and they burst out to go do, live their own lives. But they can still live individually on their own. I mean, your cells can't. Your cells are dependent on all the others. You got a cell sitting here in my arm that needs the temperature just right. It needs sugar brought to it. It needs oxygen brought to it. It needs waste taken away. It needs magnesium, sodium, calcium. Everything has to be just right. And so all the other cells, your lung cells, your heart cells, everything, are, are working together. So pretty cool. Well, the cell theory, and again, I'm talking, this is a theory, but in a scientific way. You hear people say a theory of evolution is just a theory or something like that. No, no, a theory in science is not some harebrained idea. Right? It, it means it's, it's been, uh, it's been uh, substantiated again and again and again through all different angles. You know, a hypothesis is just a guess. You know? That's what it says. But the theory of cells is that everything is, life is made out of cells. Now, why is it only a theory? Well, because we haven't looked at every single creature on Earth. You know, maybe there's some Amazonian plant, we cut it open and it doesn't make, it's not made of cells. So we can't say everything's made of cells, but I would bet a lot of them are. And all life made of cells. Yes. And viruses and you know, yeah, that type of thing. Um, and so, um, and that cells come from cells. It used to be thought that life came from mud or air, things like that. But uh, that's the deal. Everything's made of cells, cells divide, and you can't get any lower than a cell to be alive. Your mitochondria are the bad example. Like your nucleus can't live on its own. Well, a little history, just real briefly. You guys studied probably this guy Hook, and uh, we didn't know anything about cells until the 1600s when he started grinding glass into lenses. And we started looking at pond water, looking at slices of cork, and we saw, damn, everything's got these little little rooms like that. And those uh, they look like monastery cells, or like dorm rooms. Uh, or prison cells, but anyway, that's why they're named cells, and uh, yeah, all life is made of them. It's smart. And one thing that we often get wrong, uh, I mean, I find myself too, is that you look at a cell in lab, like, like in lab, we're looking at a microscope slide, and it looks so two-dimensional. Because it is, you're looking at a slice, a very two-dimensional slice. So here's a cuboidal cell, and you're like, oh, it's a cuboidal cell, yeah. Well, in reality, you know, it's, oh, damn, look at that. I was a little worried about that. Yeah, three-dimensional, it's three-dimensional like that. And um, you can see in some of these views, you can get, there's special microscopes called phase contrast that put the light at different angles so it looks three-dimensional. And then that, uh, this other kind of electron micrograph that'll scan around it, so it gives it a three-dimensional look to it. But uh, the cells themselves are not just um, squares or rectangles. They are three-dimensional, so just keep that in mind. And of course, life uses uh, uh, DNA, you know, DNA or RNA. All life, everything uses the same, and the same genes, too, for basic functions. We have the same genes as red men and bacteria. Because we inherited it. So what is the biggest cell? And why can't cells be huge? Why are cells, why look at a microscope and see a cell? Why aren't there like big ones hanging out? Does anyone know? Does anyone know? What is the issue in biology when you when you get a bigger and bigger cell? What's really going to be the limiting factor? Biology. I stumped you, huh? And yes, the reason is it's a surface area to volume. You see those when you get big, 
I think mean, beach ball has uh, actually has not that much surface area for its huge volume. So there's diffusion of nutrients and oxygen. You can't get to the middle of this room stack. So you have to be really small so that you have more surface area to volume. It's like a big beach ball versus the same volume with a bunch of ping pong balls. Those ping pong balls have a lot of surface area. And so things can get in easily from the outside. So that's why you can't have really big cells, is because the surface area to volume. Not enough time, it takes so long to diffuse into a big cell, so you've got to be tiny. Yeah, but the biggest cell is, is an egg. I guess today it would be an ostrich egg. Who might have bigger eggs? Someone says, what came first, the chicken or the egg? Actually, there were eggs before there were chickens. That's how it okay. But uh, that's a point. Um, there's some expensive eggs, like uh, caviar. Delicious, salty caviar. And actually, the most expensive egg would be like a human egg. You want to sell it. Yeah, and you think it's real easy. Um, women thinking, oh, I'll sell an egg and I'll make some thousands of dollars. But it's not like you just go in and like, I'll give you an egg. You, have to, you get um, hormone shots so you can um, time your ovulation with the, well, who's going to get the egg. And then you kind of super ovulate, you're making a lot of eggs, and then they harvest them. So it's, it's not as easy as I'm going to walk in there one day and give my eggs. Sperm, giving sperm is much easier. <laughs> you don't get much money. Um, but uh, uh, you can donate eggs and get thousands of dollars. Can you donate a kidney and get thousands of dollars? Can you? Why not? <laughs> you cannot. You cannot in this country. There's a few countries you can buy a kidney. Why can't you? If someone offered you um, half, a million, half a million dollars for a kidney, would you take it? Yeah. I mean, you sure that, maybe. Um, of course, you only have two kidneys, right? And if something goes wrong, you can't go back and say, I want my kidney back, right? And so there is a danger involved with one kidney, but you can live a perfectly normal life. You only need one kidney. Um, so why don't we do that? You can sell your eggs, you can sell sperm. We sell plasma, why can't we sell it? Well, bioethics, whole interesting side of things, but we just don't want there to be a setup where the poor people sell their organs to the rich people. That's what it comes down to. And uh, there are places in the world where um, they coerce people to sell uh, their organs for money because they're so desperately poor, and it's just a sad situation. So we're going with that. You can give it away. It's all legally, I guess, but anyway, so uh, I, I, I'm going off on the tangent a little bit, but so eggs are one big freaking cell. And then our body, of course, we have all different kinds of cells. I told you that. We looked at all these tissues. You guys saw them in, in your home or in person so far. And they look so very different. You know, I don't know what you guys have looked at yet. You look at bone, and you look at uh, tumoral cells, and you look at blood. And uh, again, all of these cells, like 200 kinds of cells maybe, you know, it depends how you split it up, um, they all come from the basic stem cell, right? That sperm and egg, that zygote, that fertilized egg. And so how do you get such different tissues from that same cell, you know? And it all has to do with what genes are expressed. So depending on where it is in the body, they get signals to express certain genes. And bone genes turn on the genes to make bone. And they turn off the genes to make blood and hemoglobin and insulin and growth factor, that growth hormone. So that's the deal. That I can take one cell out of my finger and grow a whole new gem. A whole new gem and get every kind of cell because it has all the instructions in my DNA. But in your body, they differentiate. So stem cells, true stem cells can become anything. And then you're going to see as we go along, we kind of narrow our choices. We can only become certain things. So that a cartilage cell can only divide into cartilage cells. That looks very different looking. All right, you guys got pretty good microscopes in lab. I don't know the price of them. They got to be at least a grand. I don't know. I didn't buy them. Um, but uh, basically, some things with that is that magnification is, is how big it is. It's twice the size, ten times the size. And um, our lab's microscopes, we looked at 400 times. There was a thousand times on there. You could go to Walmart or something like that, and you can buy a microscope that goes up to a thousand times for like 20 bucks. Honestly, you can buy these toy microscopes. But what's the difference? They have the same magnification. Why are we 
you know, spending so much money on ours and laugh. Well, that second thing is resolution. And that's how well you can tell apart. Um, well, for instance, two dots are the distance. That look like two dots? Oh. That's two dots. All right, damn it. But if I went back even further, I wouldn't be able to tell what this next. That would look like one dot in a cheap microscope. So it has to do with how, how good the glass is, how, how well they uh, grind it and the shape of it and how big it is. To be able to, resolution is to tell the difference and differentiate between you know, little tiny parts. So you can use that cheap microscope and really see things close, but it's kind of blurry. In ours in lab, you get really close, and you can focus it pretty sharp. So that's the difference, is the resolution, how you can resolve or tell how you can apart. And then contrast is how uh, different they look from each other. We're going to look at blood in lab, and if we didn't stain it, you wouldn't be able to see much. You know, it makes things uh, jump out of you. So you want to stain our tissues in our microscopes in lab. Magnification and magnification. Well, a light microscope is what we use. And it's pretty cool. You guys can see 400, 1,000 times magnification. Awesome. But you guys can't see DNA, you know, things like that. They're really small viruses with a microscope in labs. Because it's limited because it uses visible light. And so the wavelength of visible light is the uh, limiting factor for how small we can see stuff. And then we have on campus an electron microscope. That was invented. And now all of a sudden we can see down to nanometers instead of microscopes. Yeah. So just you know, take, a, take a gander and take a look and see uh, what you can see with your human eyes. You can see eggs, but you can't see anything. Like if you're in lab, you couldn't like look up at one of your slides and like see the cells, right? So, that's true. And you can see bacteria, although they're really small in a light microscope. Bacteria look tiny compared to like an animal cell. And then you need an electron microscope to start seeing, you know, big molecules and viruses. And we even have a microscope that goes down here now to see. Does anyone know what that's called? We have one like that. It's called an atomic force microscope. <coughs> And uh, this thing, you put your sample here. It can even be as small as a big DNA molecule. And then there's a, a, a hammer like this, the serious hammer. And the hammer goes as the sample moves. And there's a laser that comes off of the mirror, a laser that comes off and it goes on the screen. So it actually hits it with a hammer like this. And the whole sample is a little bit higher in places where the molecule goes up. So. Atomic force microscope. Yeah. All right, in terms of staining, just so you know what you're doing, uh, while in lab, all those slides were H and E stained. And all these stains um, came about just through trial and error. There were fabric stains and stuff. You know, there's no big, there's no secret. It's kind of trial and error, what works well. But all the ones in lab you see are pretty much going to look like this kind of pink, with the nucleus looks purple. And it's because we use uh, this H and E stain with the basic stuff is the hematoxylin and the eosin stains the acidic stuff, collagen is more acidic. And you get this kind of nice beauty look. You get a good contrast between different organelles. So H and E stain is what we just a common, common stain that works real general for almost all the tissues in lab. And just for fun, there's, there's other stains, real expensive stains, and you can even uh, you can do some real fancy stuff. Do this with gold. You can add some of these neurons in the cerebellum of the brain. So, oh. All right. So you guys look at a light microscope, and uh, you can see if you look at again these uh, meters, you know, uh, talking about uh, nanometers and picometers for the atomic force. And so yeah, we have these tools and. Uh, as these tools were developed, you learn more and more. I talked about that in, in uh, my recorded lecture, I believe, how scientific knowledge accumulates. And it's not just a straight line. It's uh, 
it goes quickly and then it kind of asymptotes and quickly. And what happens at each of these inflection points where you learn a lot really quickly, it's usually a new microscope is developed or a new idea comes about, and then there's all kinds of flurry of activity. So electron microscope was developed and you learn so much so quickly. And then uh, later on another thing is developed, like atomic force. Now we're learning even more. So uh, yeah, a lot of cool strange things. But these last two, you can't even look with your bare eyes. It's all on a TV screen. Yeah, so here's an electron microscope. Uh, it's expensive. You've got to hire someone, a technician. You put the sample in, it's in a vacuum, and you look on a TV screen. You don't actually see it these days. The consequence of this, you can't put a live tissues in there, like, a, um, like in lab, in biology lab. You guys probably put some uh, algae in there, and you look at a microscope, you see the chloroplast, everything's moving. Or you can put a frog uh, uh, foot on there and see the blood vessels in the capillaries. This thing's in a vacuum, so you got to physically kill whatever you put in there. So that's one thing. And uh, instead of staining it with any kind of colored stains, it doesn't matter colors. This is all like TV electromagnetic waves. So you stain it with heavy metals, like perfectly gold or copper, something like that. So that's the difference. Big old machine, but damn, once you look things really close. And your book, and I'll show pictures of electron microscopes. Oh, two types. Uh, TEM, and you'll see this uh, all over your book. You'll see the TEM or SEM. You know what it means, and I'll ask you what it means. Uh, transmission is just when they uh, make a slice, and then the electrons go through it. And some will go right through and be captured in the screen, and some will bounce off because they hit something. So that'll give you your, your image, which ones go through. You should get x-rays, and which ones get scattered. And then I'll show you a picture with the scanning electron microscope. This thing, you put the sample down, and the, the electron gun just goes mm, mm, it like scans over it, and it gets a three-dimensional image, so it's really cool. Transmission is the most magnification, like go right through it. But scanning gives you this view, a three-dimensional view of the surface of something. Yeah, so this is a TEM. I think you passed it. Now the colors you see here and in your book are fake. Some are just Photoshopped them. They just do it just to give more contrast, more interest to it. It's all black and white. But uh, look at that, you can see that sperm on that egg. You can see the, what the shape of the tail is, and the shape of the egg, and everything. Oh wait, I'll wow you with this one. Uh, I can't tell if it's in the map, but I've got a lot of you. Oh, beautiful, beautiful images. I think that's it for microscopes. Uh, yeah. Let's talk about life. The game of life. Life is not a game. Well, you guys know you're all dying, right? Yeah. Sadly, it's just a matter of time. You're on your way, uh, some quicker than others. Um, and then we die. And then possibly our genes are carried out to the next generation, maybe not. Uh, so we're here just fleetingly on this earth. And uh, when you look around at, at, at life, uh, it most certainly evolved from a bacteria-like ancestor, and it's just like a tree. And there's major branches, a major, major branch on this tree is prokaryotes and eukaryotes. And you guys all learned this in high school and college. Or so prokaryotes are your bacteria, and the eukaryotes mean they have a real true nucleus. Carry on, it carry out as a, a, a kernel, but as a real nucleus. You means true. Pro means before. But bacteria are uh, get a bad rap, of course, all the diseases they cause. But bacteria is also, you know, very very helpful. Uh, it decomposes everything. We have symbiotic bacteria in our gut that we pretty much need. But uh, basically, you guys know that they have, they don't have a nucleus, they don't have any organelles that have membranes around them. Simple DNA, um, I mean, very few, a lot less genes, a lot less junk. Um, they, some of them can swim, and a lot of them are sticky, have a cell wall that can stick on computer mice and, and doorknobs, things like that. Uh, yeah. And so bacteria, again, there's a whole rogues list of uh, ones that cause diseases, but then there's a whole bunch that are that uh, allow life to exist, really. 
If you hold up a handful of herb that has more bacteria than all people that have ever lived, they're successful, damn. They can eat anything, except for like styrofoam, rubber, you know? They can eat anything. They can live in uh, hot vents. They can live in salty lakes. And so they're very successful. Um, uh, and then the archaea are the, uh, a, a group of bacteria that are, they're, they're really different than normal bacteria, but it's not really <coughs> fun. Cool. Uh, but bacteria, you know, they've got a cell wall. We don't have a cell wall. We have a cell membrane, a plasma membrane. But bacteria and plants and fungi have cell walls. So they have a cell wall that surrounds them, which is yellow. And a lot of them have sticky appendages, so they can stick out things called fomites, a lot of disease talk now, when, they, that, when uh, viruses and, and bacteria, they stay on surfaces, right? Um, so that'll help some of that. Some of them have, have, have flagella and they swim towards light or towards food or away from danger, so. Yeah, they're not too bright, but they can, they can move. And you can see in here, there's no like uh, mitochondria, no nucleus. The DNA is naked, it's just like in this region. It's naked, it's small, it's circular. Yeah, that's a bacteria. And then there's us. We are eukaryotes. Us and plants, fungi, and protozoa. The rest of life are eukaryotes. And uh, our DNA is in, uh, it's a little different. Instead of being a circle, it's in chromosomes, it's in pieces, right? And um, there's a lot of subtle differences. But the main thing is that we have membrane bound organelles, which means we have organelles that have a membrane around. And these are all the parts, the nucleus, the mitochondria, the Golgi, the endoplasmic reticulum, all these things. And you can imagine the benefit of that. Um, what probably happened was that <coughs> there was the original cell, it's bacteria-like. No, what probably happened is that there was a, uh, sort of the cell membrane came in a little bit like that. That allows like stuff to happen over here. It's kind of separate from our weight, right? But if you think about it, if you live in a, a studio apartment with just one room, right? You can't cook anything without the whole room smelling like what you're cooking, right? And if you have a roommate, there's no hope of privacy, right? So <laughs> with uh, having different rooms allows you to have different, uh, well in this case, chemical reactions that are not being interfered with because you only have one room. And so I can see, uh, this little membrane eventually uh, turning into its own little room like that. And then you can have unique stuff happening in that little, uh, that little room. So eukaryotes have membrane-bound organelles, different organs inside, so they can separate out what they're doing. Cool. All right, and here's your basic cell. All right. About time for a break. That's pretty good. Eight thirty almost. So uh, this is your basic, your basic cell, right? You guys know these parts, right? Big old nucleus. Uh, you can see this is a cell membrane. There's no wall. There's nothing solid about it. It's uh, if you pushed on this, it'd be like it would give. It would, it's, it's fluid. That whole membrane around it. Yeah. And then all these, see all the membrane-bound organelles. They're, they've got stuff inside of them. They got like rooms inside of them where they can do stuff outside of uh, everyone knowing about it. They can like nothing else is interfering with their chemical reactions because they do it in these vesicles, these little, little organelles. And so the cytoplasm. Here's, well, here's some terms. You guys make sure you know these. I promise you on the test there's going to be questions on these organelles, what they do. You know, so I'll just I'm just going to go through them. Most of you know that, but the cytoplasm is the stuff inside a cell. The stuff, the liquid, and all the organelles inside the cell. The cytosol is just the food. So that's a slight difference. The cytoplasm is the stuff inside the cell. Well, probably the most important thing about the cell we look at it is this cell membrane. So this is the plasma membrane that surrounds it. And that what's what allows what comes in and out. So some may interested, some of you interested in pharmacy, I know you look at any kind of drugs, you gotta see can the drug get into the cell? Can it get past that membrane? And we're gonna see that membrane is fatty. It's these phospholipids, fatty. 
But we'll see how things that are fatty can just go right in. The things that are charged uh, or have are poor, they can't get in because they can't see that fatty layer. But on the cell, we're going to have all these proteins, these channels and receptors. And so that's how drugs and things can work. Because uh, it's almost like having a, a doorman you know, on the outside. It's going to allow certain things in and not other things. And there's pumps that are constantly pumping at the wall. So that membrane is the is the wall between the inside intracellular stuff and the extracellular stuff. So we're talking a lot about that. Yeah, I see words selectively permeable, which means some things go in, like oxygen, no problem. Carbon dioxide, in and out. But your big old uh, glucose molecule, bam, you like stop at the wall and you can't get in. You need to find a channel to get in. So I said oxygen just goes in. Small enough. And it's made out of phospholipids, so it's fat, so it's phosphorus on it. Okay, I'll show you that. And then all animal plasma membranes have cholesterol in them. So people say, oh, I, I want zero cholesterol in my body. Well, you'd be dead, right? Every single one of your trillions of cells has cholesterol in the membrane. It helps stabilize it. Much better fat. And then I'll take a little break and we'll talk about these different kinds of proteins that are on the surface of the cell. And they're going to be important in this class. Yeah, I'm going to take a break. I'm going to take a four minute break because I can. Uh, so 8.36, we shall resume. So relax. If there's any questions, you can ask me individually. 